Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you all for uh, coming. Today is really a uh, very special day for us at Toro Law Center as uh, we get to uh, announce and present an exhibit about uh, Paula Eisenberg, who was a court reporter during the uh, war crime trials. And I want to thank Professor Lewis Silverman, uh, who made this possible, as well as the members of his family that are with us today. Our uh, programming today is going to start with a special guest speaker. And then we will go up to the library for those that are able to join us. And so to introduce the substantive part of the program and our speaker, I'd like to welcome up um, our faculty member, Professor Harry Riker, who is the scholar in residence at our Holocaust and International Human Rights uh, Law Institute. Thank you, Dean Salkin. It's an honor to be here. Immediately after the Second World War and the Holocaust, one of the very first objects was to bring perpetrators to justice. The most well-known trial that came out of that decision was the trial conducted before the International Military Tribunal, bringing to the bar of justice 22 of the leading figures in the Nazi political and military establishments who were both alive and in captivity at that time. Hermann Goering was the lead defendant. After that, the United States conducted 12 lesser trials, as they became known, roughly by profession, the doctors, the lawyers, and so on. But the United States, acting within the US zone of occupation, also conducted military trials by concentration camp. And a number of these were conducted at Dachau concentration camp in Germany. And one of those was the particular trial that we focus on today, the Buchenwald trial. This is the tribunal in that trial. The trial, which ran from April to August 1947, brought to the bar of justice 13 leading practitioners of horror in Buchenwald concentration camp, beginning with the commandant at the time and going down the chain of command. It was a chamber of horrors in many, many different ways. The different horrors that were perpetrated at Buchenwald are too numerous to mention at the moment. I'm cutting my remarks quite deliberately so as not to impinge on our keynote speaker, Professor Ken, uh, Ken Walzer, who has come specially from Michigan State University to grace this event, to give just one simple example of the horrors that were perpetrated. There was a pastor who was an anti-Nazi protester the then commandant of Buchenwald, Karl Otto Koch, K-O-C-H, ordered that he be given a slow death. Over a period of 18 months, this poor man was put in a cell and kept in a cell which was lice infested. He was ankle deep in fetid water and was subjected to daily beatings and torture. That was not atypical of the sort of horrors that were perpetrated in Buchenwald. Without question, the most notorious defendant at Buchenwald was Ilse Koch, the wife of the commandant, who earned herself the sobriquet, the bitch of Buchenwald. She was a particularly nasty, sadistic, and callous person. She was accused of having a morbid fascination with tattoos to the extent that when she saw a tattoo on a prisoner which appealed to her, she would order that the prisoner be put to death and then be skinned so that she could have the tattoo which was then uh, made into either a lampshade or made into a, 
um, a photo album or in some cases uh, gloves even for her pleasure. This is a table of exhibits. On the right, we see one of those lampshades and be below that, some skin with tattoos. Uh, over on the left, we see two shrunken heads of prisoners who were decapitated and whose heads were then shrunk, uh, resembling something coming out of Africa. The result was that all 31 of the defendants were convicted. The chief prosecutor was Lieutenant Colonel William Denson, who actually tried four of the trials at Dachau, including the Buchenwald trial, and he had a 100% conviction record. Some of those convicted were sentenced to death, and the sentences were in fact carried out. Others were sentenced to death and had their sentences commuted to life, and in other cases, the, uh, they were sentenced to prison terms and they were also reduced considerably. This is Ilse Koch being sentenced to life imprisonment. Her sentence was reduced. The reason behind the reduction of the sentences was that Germany was now defeated and it was out of the picture. There was a new enemy, the Soviet Union, so Winston Churchill had given his famous Iron Curtain speech, and now all forces were focused on the new enemy, and it was a question of getting West Germany on side as an ally in the fight against the Soviet Union. The commutation uh, of the reduction, I should say, in sentence of Ilse Koch was the one which sparked an absolute outrage. She was, uh, she was sentenced to life imprisonment, and she ended up being sentenced to four years imprisonment by General Lucius Clay, the commandant of the US forces. The outrage spread back here into the United States because she had been the subject of newsreels. The, the reporters went berserk over this woman and the tales of sadism that emerged in the, in the trial and surrounding the trial to the extent that there were Senate hearings and ultimately she was tried a second time for murder and brutal acts of other sorts. Uh, the, the lampshade, the skin uh, were, uh, charges were dropped because it was considered that there wasn't uh, incontrovertible evidence. So. The Buchenwald trial ended up with uh, a mixed report, uh, and in fact, only some of the uh, defendants got what they really deserved. There were many who got off very, very lightly compared to the atrocities which they had committed. Let me now invite my colleague, Professor Lou Silverman, to build on the foundation that has been laid in relation to the Buchenwald trial. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, especially the civil procedure students. Uh, I'd like to thank Dean Salkin for hosting the exhibit, Linda Howard Weissman, Assistant Dean for Development, for the planning and implementation. Um, I'd like to introduce my cousin, Naomi Eisenberg, Henry for donating all of her mother's memorabilia and, <laughs> and Naomi's husband Mark and her daughter Sarah and I have various other relatives here you can all say hello um, and most of all I want to thank Beth Mobley the associate director of the Toro Law Library who put this exhibit together <laughs> and uh, way back in the corner and Beth we really appreciate it uh, when I brought the original materials to Beth, um, she was excited about them and found all kinds of other things. I haven't actually seen the exhibit. We did a test run in March. I took a quick look. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what's in it. Paula Eisenberg was born in Brooklyn. In, Paula Silverman Eisenberg was born in Brooklyn in um, 1912. Uh, and they grew up in a, I don't want to say sheltered ex uh, environment, but 
they lived in Brooklyn. They were, they were already second generation. Um, Paula was always a rather feisty person. Uh, when she was 30, she joined the Army, when the uh, Women's Army Corps had just become regular Army. And she was taught court reporting and uh, spent much of World War II in um, California and then Hawaii. And uh, she had just come home after the war, and she got a phone call, would you go be a court reporter at some trials that were going to be occurring in Germany? And she went, and it was really um, an eye-opener um, to what had been going on, because fortunately the Silverman family uh, didn't, um, everybody had been here generally before 1900. Um, and when she came back, she started telling the story. And then when um, she and Kurt retired to um, the Phoenix area in 1979, she started going through her materials and realized she had a couple of original items from the trial, including the sentencing report, which all 31 defendants had signed. Uh, Ilsa Koch's name was right at the beginning. Um, and um, so she realized in, in talking, she found out that the young people of, of that generation knew nothing about these things. So she started making presentations to the point where she um, developed a, a whole presentation where she went around presenting high schools in the Phoenix area and other, um, other um, places. And um, she asked Naomi and me before she died to make sure that the material wasn't lost. So um, we, we put it together and with Beth's help did a whole exhibit. Um, one of the things, which I, I don't want to comment on a lot of it, um, but one of the things um, Professor Reichen mentioned that most of the sentences were commuted. In Paula's folder, uh, when we went through it, there are tons of newspaper articles, mostly from New York and Washington papers, about the commutation of the sentence. And I remember um, Paula well into her 90s, because she died, it'll be two years ago next month, and she was 99 and a half at the time. But I can remember her telling me not that many years ago how disgusting it was that because politics had changed, you know, these people had their sentences commuted to four and five years. And um, one last thing, in the exhibit there is a picture of a skull, a human skull that Paula, as the court reporter, had to ID and tag during the trial, and I remember her many times telling us about that. Um, Paul was a, was a character. She was a Silverman, of course. And, um, and um, I hope that some of you will, uh, at some point, um, look at the links to her Shoah tapes. Um, um, her husband, Kurt, who managed to get out of Germany just before World War II and came here after World War II. There's a Shoah tape from him. I've never actually seen it. Have you seen it, Naomi? There has seen it, okay. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's something we can never forget. And it was Paula's point that we never forget. Now, Buchenwald has the reputation um, for being this horrible camp where Ilse Koch did all these terrible things. But there were also some, some wonderful things that ultimately happened. And our guest speaker today is going to talk about them. I'm pleased to introduce um, Professor Kenneth Walter, who is the Director of Jewish Studies at Michigan State University. Good afternoon, Toro. Greetings from Michigan State. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many people here today. I feel gratified making the trip. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here today and to speak about Buchenwald while joining in honoring the memory of Paula Eisenberg, who was a court reporter in April 47, two years after the liberation of the camp, confronted some of its horrible realities during the trials of 31 leaders from Buchenwald. Buchenwald was the first camp the Allies liberated, American troops. And the shock of what they encountered there generated in the subsequent weeks in mid-45 a remarkable spectacle of attention. It was the center of the world for a couple of weeks in spring 1944, 45. And that spectacle was prelude to the later trial that Paul Eisenberg worked at. Radio reporters, photographers, film directors, writers, visiting generals, congressmen and women, members of parliament, members of uh, 
leading editors and publishers from American newspapers, and literally thousands of U.S. soldiers poured into Buchenwald near Weimar in order to see what America was fighting against. It was their first opportunity to do so. Photographs and films were taken and reports were written that later were part of the trials, representing the murderous and inhumane conditions of the place that Professor Reicher has referenced. It was here that Americans first encountered survivors with their sunken eyes and cadaverous bodies, as well as piles of bodies stacked like cordwood. It was here that Americans first walked among the filthy pestilent barracks and stared in horror at people too weak to stand or to leave their roosts. This was the place where local citizens from Weimar were paraded by American soldiers before the arranged exhibits of shrunken heads and a human skin landscape, and when news of horrible punishments meted out medical experiments and numerous other horrors and transgressions of the unity of the human species were first burned into our minds. It's the beginning of what we now recognize the cultural presence of the Holocaust. But here too, visitors encountered something else that simply astonished them and challenged their understanding and perhaps still does challenge our understanding. Among 21,000 surviving prisoners at, at this camp, American soldiers encountered nearly 1,000 boys, still alive. Most were adolescents, but some were younger children, and the two youngest were merely four years old. How amidst the horror were these youths and boys still alive to be liberated? Until recently, nobody asked that question. Among these youths were the 16-year-old Eliezer Weisel from Siget in Romania, later the author of Night and a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And also among these boys was the eight-year-old Israel Mirlau from Pietrakov, Poland, who's later the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel and today the head of Yad Vashem's council. Nearly all the youths were orphans, and more than 90% were Jews, or a few gypsies. Who were these youths, what had been their experiences, and how amidst the horrors had they endured until liberation? That's what I want to talk about in the 20, 25 minutes I have. In my brief talk today, I will take you to Buchenwald in April, May 1945, amidst the spectacle nearly 70 years ago. I will introduce you to the boys, and I will tell and show images about their post-liberation story. And then briefly, time remaining, I'll explain how it could be that children and youths were rescued inside a concentration camp. Now some of you may know the literature about the Holocaust, which often does focus on rescue. But rescue is thought about in terms of keeping people out of concentration camps. There's nothing written yet on rescue inside a concentration camp. And the first story, I of, the first question I often get after I make a presentation like this was Buchenwald sui generis. Was it by itself? Um, it doesn't tell us anything about the other camps. But there were similar rescue efforts on a smaller scale, scale in some other camps. So this is opening up a whole new way of looking at the camps. As I mentioned, when General Patton's U.S. Third Army arrived at Buchenwald on April 11, 45, American soldiers found 21,000 prisoners, and they found all the horrible things that uh, Professor Reich has talked about that came out later at the trials. In fact, they made films that were shown at the trials. But equally shocking to all the men who came and were told by, Pres uh, by uh, uh, Commander Eisenhower to come, were the nearly 1,000 children and teenagers who the, chil who the soldiers first saw playing amidst the bodies. There were bodies throughout the camp. The crematoria had run out of fuel. 
Uh, they piled up. Uh, many of the pictures uh, of this spectacle period were of piles and piles of bodies. Um, but here were 1,000 boys, about 85 percent adolescents, 14 to 17 years old, um, and about 15 percent under 14, two youngest four, but others six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 12 years old. You'll see pictures of them shortly. Edward R. Murrow broadcast from Buchenwald on Thursday, April 12th, uh, a, a, a production that was relayed and heard here in the United States on April 15th, that Sunday. And he mentioned the hundreds of children. Um, he was shocked by the tattoos uh, that many of them had on their arm, which was a telltale sign they'd been at Auschwitz. Margaret Bork White, who was then the leading American photographer, uh, photographed in the camp on the same day as Murrow broadcasted. And she took pictures of children as well as adults and piles of bodies. See the children there, skinny legs, looking on. Now, this is Margaret Bork White's famous photograph of political prisoners from Buchenwald. It appeared in Life magazine in May of 45. And I want you to take a good look at the condition of these prisoners who were in the main camp. Buchenwald was divided between a main and a lower, or kleiner lager, little camp. Um, and uh, most of the veteran prisoners were in the main camp. And these guys don't look so sunken-eyed. They don't look so skinny, like skeletons. They look fairly healthy for people who've been in concentration camps for a while. Margaret Bork White's lesser known photograph here is of a relationship that I hope to show to you, of an older prisoner mentoring a smaller boy. Um, and that's the hidden secret um, of what took place at Buchenwald. In this camp, there was a rescue story of, by veteran prisoners of these youths. They committed themselves to saving youths, largely because youths were the future. Youths were the world that they were going to build after the fall of Nazism. Um, and here you see many of the boys that you saw before looking on at the fence uh, while this guy's got his arm around somebody he'd looked after. Uh, those are the Germans brought by the Americans from nearby Weimar, it's about five kilometers away, um, to look at Buchenwald, and you see what they saw. Uh, they're averting their eyes. Uh, they said they didn't know. Uh, it was a lie, because many of them worked in the camp, supplied the camp. American soldiers also photographed the, uh, the children. Um, and this is a photograph that uh, appeared on the web uh, about five, six years ago by a retired soldier who was part of the liberation, who made a website about all the pictures he took while he was three weeks at Buchenwald during this period, treasure trove. Um, he didn't know who these kids were. They didn't know who he was. He couldn't speak Polish or Yiddish. Um, they couldn't speak English. Um, but they're all boys from Pietrakov, same place that Israel Miralau comes from. Uh, and we've been able to identify four of them. Uh, this is from U.S. Signal Corps footage. Uh, taken uh, the week after liberation. Uh, Billy Wilder, the film director, was there with a crew from Hollywood uh, filming all this. That's the film that was shown at the trial in 47. Um, the guy to the right of the small guy in the middle um, with a jacket and looking uh, at the camera is a guy who lives in Minneapolis. His name is Natan Schwartz. And he's ubiquitous in all these pictures. He must have, wherever he saw a camera, he got in front of it. Um, and, uh, but he can't be interviewed. He's one of the few who I haven't interviewed because he can't talk about it without breaking down. Um, this is part of the story. We haven't identified this block. Uh, I initially thought it was one of the blocks where the children um, was, uh, uh, were stashed. Um, but we don't know the provenance of the picture. And all the survivors, uh, who are now men in their mid-80s, they were so young when they were uh, liberated, have told me that that's not Block 66. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but there are these two pictures which give you an idea that something interesting was taking place. Um, this photograph was shot by a Belgian photographer traveling uh, with Patton's army. Um, he shot a lot of group pictures uh, in the camp the first week. Um, and it's very clear we've identified eight of these boys. Um, all were in a block, block 66. And this is the best picture I have of the kind of 
uh, boys who were in Block 66. There's a few older ones, but there's a couple here who are very young. Um, the small boy um, with suspenders is a man by the name of Izio Rosenman. He lives in Paris. I had breakfast with him in December. He is the head of the French equivalent of the National Science Foundation. Um, he was 10 years old in the camp. Uh, the tall boy right in the middle um, is Naftali First. He grew to be 6'6 and was on the Israeli volleyball team. Um, and the boy with his finger to his eye in the front row is Sam Gross, who lived in uh, St. Petersburg uh, the end of his uh, life and uh, contributed to the Holocaust Museum that was built there. Um, this gives you a sense of what the condition was of these boys. Um, the uh, sixth boy from the left um, is a boy who went on, who returned to Czechoslovakia after the war and played professional soccer. Um, uh, he, he was able to bounce back, um, later came to the United States, um, worked for the government and refereed soccer games in Washington. Um, this is Buchenwald, um, the place um, that we're talking about. And it was built on the top of a mountain, the Edisburg Hill. Um, and it had a factory near it, the Guslav Ornaments Work, where they made rifle and ammunition. Um, and the DAW, which was a woodworking place. Um, you see the, uh, uh, to the right, uh, lower part of the right, where there's a kind of semicircle. That's where the SS remained. And then the main part of the camp was to the left and down the hill. Um, you walk through a gate, there was a big roll call plaza, um, and then there were something like 67 barracks all lined up. Um, and once you understand the topography, you begin to understand some of the dynamics here. This is looking from the bottom of the hill up, and the last block, block 66, built among other blocks, 65 and 67, which was an invalid sec section of the camp, was where many boys between December and January 44, 45, and April 45 were stashed under veteran directorship. Um, Eli Wiesel was in Block 66. Um, there w wound up to be something over 900 boys. Can you imagine that? 900 boys who'd been in the concentration camps for years, who were starving, um, who were anything uh, 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 but tough, really tough. Um, they were all stashed in the same barrack and guys directed them and controlled them uh, inside that barrack. Um, that's block 66. That's the best uh, picture I've been able to get of block 66. Again, another picture by the Belgian photographer, Belgian, uh, Bernard Raphael Aljouet. Now, here are some key figures in what was a clandestine effort to protect the boys. Uh, the man on the left, you see uh, uh, in the front of the picture, a guy turned over his right shoulder looking back at a man, a young man in his 30s at that point. That's Antonin Kalina. That's a picture below of him in his 80s. Um, he was the block elder, the head of the block at Block 66. And as a consequence of our making a film called Kinder Block 66, which is now available and being distributed, um, we got Yad Vashem to declare him a righteous among the nations. All the heads of the blocks in Buchenwald have now been recognized. Um, and there's been something like four or five of these righteous awards. The guy on the right is Wilhelm Heyman, a teacher from Hesse um, in, in uh, uh, Germany. He was the head of Block 8, which was the other barracks um, where boys were stashed. This was a smaller barrack, about 300. Uh, boys were there, and about 150 of them were Jews. Um, the book Saving Children by Jack Werber, Yaakov Werber, tells the story from the inside. It's available. Um, Yaakov Werber was one of the Polish Jewish cadres, the people on the ground with these boys. Uh, the Germans couldn't handle it by themselves. They didn't speak the language. They needed intermediaries to be able to win the confidence of the boys, win the confidence of fathers who might have accompanied the boys to the camp so that they would let go of them and let them go into the children's barrack because they couldn't go with their fathers. Um, so Yaakov Werber was one of these guys, the, the lower 
uh, part of the picture uh, with the boys is another guy by the name of Alec Greenbaum, uh, Grinbaum from uh, Tarnow. He was, Werber and Grinbaum were the two main cadres. And the young man with the glasses at the bottom is actually later the last editor of the Yiddish Daily Forward, Motola Strigla. He was recruited off a transport to start a school in the barracks. If you can believe it, in the middle of this concentration camp, not only were boys clustered and protected, but they had to do something to while away the time, and they had to do something to raise their spirits, and there was actually a clandestine school in Block 8 and Block 66 where the kids put on performances, and they were led to believe that someday the Nazis would get theirs, and they'd be free, and they'd have a future. The two youngest children entered Buchenwald at three years old. Um, they were four at liberation. This is Josef Schliefstein from Sandomierz in Poland. Um, uh, the, the color uh, photo is from the Signal Corps film. He was uh, front and center in some of the filming. Um, he smiles at the camera. Um, uh, the other picture is on a running board of a United Nations relief and rehabilitation truck. Um, uh, in May, and that's he with his father, Israel Schliefstein, who was also in the camp, but was persuaded by Werber um, in Yiddish to trust in them, let the boy go to Barrack 66, and he was elsewhere in the camp. Um, here you get a sense of what was going on. There's Israel Schliefstein with his son, Joseph Schleifstein. Uh, and many of the kind of middle-level people who were recruited as part of the clandestine effort to watch over the kids in the barracks. This is the other young boy. His name is Stefan Yerzy Zweig, Yushu, uh, also born in 41 from Krakow. Uh, he was with his father in the camp. His father was persuaded to let him go. Um, and he wound up in Block uh, 40 initially and then uh, Block 8 for a while. And the guy he's kneeling with was the 25-year-old block elder of Block 8, which was the first barrack in which children were stashed at Buchenwald. Um, he also is one of the righteous among the nations. Um, the pictures of uh, Schleifstein and, and Zweig look closely alike. And the European archivists have had a terrible time telling them apart. So this one has been identified as Stefan Yerzy Zweig. But I think it's Joseph Schliefstein, if you look at the pictures. You can tell by his ears. Um, the guy right of him is David uh, um, uh, Perlmutter. Um, he lives right by the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. I had lunch with him in December. And the boy standing behind is R Robert Weissman, Romek Weissman, uh, who lives in Vancouver and is very active in the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center there. Um, this gives you an idea of the range of ages of these boys. Um, there's Schleifstein in front. Um, there were not many clean clothes at Buchenwald, so of all things, they dressed these kids in German youth uniforms. Um, many of them went to uh, France later wearing these uniforms, and it got them into a little trouble because the French thought the Germans were coming again. Um, so they had to paint things on the side of the train to let them know that they weren't Germans coming again. They were uh, former prisoners of the Germans. Uh, the tall guy in the front on the right is Murray Goldfinger. He's a character who lives in New Jersey. You'll see him again here. Um, he's been very helpful to me in my work. And the guy on the left, the really skinny guy, gives you an insight into what some of these kids had gone through. Um, uh, he was uh, really close to, to losing it, um, but he survived and he lives in Israel. Um, this is a picture with some of the younger boys. At Schliefstein in front, uh, Israel Merlau is two to his left, our right, as we look at the uh, picture. I think, yeah. Um, and uh, the guy in the beret, berets are a telltale sign of underground connections. Uh, the guy in the beret uh, is Alec Greenbaum, who we've seen before. Um, one of the boys, one of the men watching over these boys. Um, all these kids were 12 and under. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I found the other young boy in the front. He lives in Switzerland in Basel. 
Um, this is the boys being led out of the camp on April 17th, six days after liberation. Um, the first telltale sign that there was a history uh, happening here is to ask who's leading them out. Uh, images also are signs of evidence. Um, it's not the American soldiers who are leading them out, although they're walking with them. They're being led out by Yaakov Werber, uh, Elik Greenbaum, and a third uh, figure. And that's a key to understanding that there was something that had taken place. Uh, Yaakov Werber, before he died in his 90s, um, gave me this picture. He marked the X's over his head and Elik Greenbaum's head, and he said to me, that's me, Yaakov Werber, that's Ella Greenbaum. Don't forget those names. As you can see, I've not forgotten those names. Um, of all things, life is weird. Uh, Yaakov Werber came to the United States, was a furrier, and made it big in the vogue of Daniel Boone hats in the 1950s in the United States. From Buchenwald to Daniel Boone. Um, these are pictures that give you a sense of the really horrible conditions that prevailed in, in Buchenwald. Um, this is from the Eisenhower archives. Gives you a sense of how tightly um, the boys were packed in their barrack roosts, um, three or four uh, roosts high. Um, boys tell me they slept with six or seven to a roost. Uh, if anyone turned over, everyone turned over. Um, these give you a sense, these are pictures that were used in the trial, um, give you a sense of how badly uh, the impact of being in Buchenwald played on the body of human beings. Um, these are uh, actual stories, sh uh, uh, pictures uh, shot right after liberation. And some of you may have seen this one. Um, uh, we had a curious documentary tradition in this period. You staged a picture and then you treated it like a document. This is not an actual barrack where the actual people are laying in the barracks. These are people who were brought to Barrack 56 to shoot this picture. Um, and uh, this is a picture with Eli Wiesel in it. He's the person in the second uh, roost at the very end. Um, and I've confirmed that with him. Okay. Um, memory is tricky. A lot of people identify themselves in this picture. So some of these guys have been identified as a certain person by five or six different people. Uh, so memory cannot be enough to write the story. Um, but that certainly is Eli Wiesel. Um, that's Stefan Jerzy Zweig leading, leading the May Day Parade on May 1st at Buchenwald. Um, some of you may not know this, but there was a book written in East Germany after the war called Naked Among Wolves which became required reading in the East German schools. And uh, people in the, in the uh, Soviet bloc read this book in the same way that re we read the diary of Anne Frank. And Stefan Jerzy Zweig was found in Israel and France and brought back to Germany, uh, East Germany in the 60s and became a, a large figure um, in East German Democratic Republic. This is a a very important picture. It now graces a whole wall in the Yad Vashem New Museum since 2005. It's uh, a picture of Rabbi Herschel Schachter, Orthodox rabbi from New York, first rabbi in Buchenwald, leading not the first service after liberation, but the Shavuos service in May of 1945. Um, and uh, we've been identifying people in this picture. And Israel Merrill Lau is seated between two uh, American soldiers on the left part of the picture. Uh, there was another rabbi, Rabbi Robert Marcus, who nobody's ever heard of, but he was an incredible man. He was a vice president of the American Jewish Congress and its representative to the United Nations when he dropped dead of a heart attack in 1951. Otherwise, you would have heard of him. Um, he was the other guy in Buchenwald working with the kids after liberation. And this picture was given to me by Mickey Schwartz, who's the young boy um, who had been in Block 8 um, for almost a year, um, who was standing right next to Marcus. Um, some of the same people are in this picture. Israel Mir Lau is there. Robbie Weissman is there, um, and so forth. Okay. Um, when they went to France, 
Again, they had to identify themselves um, so that uh, the train wouldn't be stopped uh, and the boys beaten. So they wrote on the side of the car, where are our parents? They're nearly all orphans. And they wrote Buchenwald of Eisen, orphans. And they were taken to Equi in France, um, where they were to begin the process of rehabilitation. Uh, you can see it's three months later and they're beginning to look fuller in their bodies. The three youngest children in France were Israel Miralau, Israel Roseman, and David Perlmutter. In mid-July, everybody danced to Hora, and 173 of the 427 who went to France left quickly for Palestine on immigration certificates, the first post-war migrants to Palestine, British Mandate Palestine, uh, to arrive after the war. And on the Mataroa, the British ship that took them, many of the boys showed off their Auschwitz tattoos, indications that Buchenwald had not been their first destination, it was their last destination. These are boys in France, um, including Robbie Weissman and his sidekick, Abe Chapnick. We know who all these boys. And another 250 boys went to Switzerland with Captain Herschel Schachter. Um, Schachter did something very interesting. Um, when a Swiss nurse turned down entry to boys who were over 16, he created counterfeit identity cards to get these boys into Switzerland. And he did it because he didn't want brothers to be broken up. People had suffered enough. And uh, when they arrived in Switzerland, there was a major international incident. They weren't gonna let the boys off the train um, and it was negotiated out. The Orthodox boys in France were separated from the secular boys and they had their own house, their own food, um, and their own traditions. Um, and if you look at this picture, you can see, if you get close to it, that Eli Wiesel is among these boys in the Orthodox homes. And there he is at the top of that group of five boys. The beginning of Eli Wiesel's return to human life. In Switzerland also, uh, boys were subdivided among secular groups and Orthodox groups. And this is an Orthodox group uh, on a Hak Shara training farm preparing for migration to Palestine. One of the boys, Tom Gev, who had been in Auschwitz and Buchenwald in block 66, was so sick at the liberation that he couldn't get out of bed. So he did a series of 80 watercolor paintings, which are now in the Yad Vashem Art Museum, and they give you a child's mind's eye of being in Buchenwald at liberation. And Stephen Jacobs, who was a six-year-old boy at Buchenwald, is now a prominent New York City architect, and he designed the memorial that was erected at Buchenwald in 2002. Let me just give you a couple of insights uh, about how this happened, and we'll close. Um, the first thing you need to understand, can you hear me without the mic? First thing you need to understand about Buchenwald is that it grew so large in size and scale and so complex in demography, all of Europe was in prison there, that the Nazis needed a middle management to run it. The Nazis wanted to stay outside the camp, not get in close contact with disease and so forth. And the German communists were their enemies. They were ideologically wrong from the Nazis' perspective but they were culturally, linguistically, ethnically, and racially right. And after the communists, the Reds, defeated the Greens, the criminals in the camp, the Nazis made a pact with them. If you run the camp in accord with Nazi specifications, we'll make a deal with you to be the influentials in the camp. That's point number one. So Buchenwald internally was run by the communists underground. Right? They couldn't do anything they wanted because the Nazis would kill them. But at the margins, given what they controlled, including the administrative offices, the blocks, the work commandos, the kitchen, the warehouses, they could 
do some things at the margins. Secondly, there was a group of Polish Jewish prisoners in Buchenwald who were trained as brick masons in the camp in 1942. In later in 1942, the Nazis made all the camps in, Buch in, in, in Germany, including Buchenwald, Judenrein, free of Jews, sent them all to Auschwitz. But they left 200 people in Buchenwald. And they moved them all into the single Jewish block in the camp, very few Jews at Buchenwald at this time, who had a German Jewish block elder by the name of Emil Karlbach. So it's like they put them in the, in, in the briar patch. They put all these men in close contact with the German communist underground. He began to trust them, they began to trust him. And when Jews started coming to the camp in large numbers in 44, 45, they were the men who were appointed room assistants and staff, and Schreiber, writer, registrar in the bar, um, in the new Jewish barracks. 22 and 23. So there's a second level of conspirators, German communists first, including other communists, Czech communists like Kalina. Um, there's a second group, Polish Jews who spoke Yiddish, who could be in contact with the boys and win their uh, approval. And then number three, the Polish Jews met all the arriving Jewish transports, which were large in number from 44 through 45. And on every transport that came, holding two or 3,000 people, they were usually 7 or 8% boys. It was all a men's camp, but these were boys, 16 and under. And so they picked out the boys, and they stashed them in Barrack 8 and Barrack 66, and for a time, Barrack 23. And they also picked out additional cadres to work with the kids, because there were so many of them, they needed a large number of mentors. Um, and that's where they found Baruch Strig uh, uh, Motola Strigler, the teacher. They also recruited the former concert master of the Riga Symphony Orchestra, Peretz Brandt, who all of a sudden was playing violin in a clandestine school in Block 66. Um, they brought people in who could teach, who could teach singing. There were no books, but they taught singing, they taught plays, um, they told stories, and they raised the spirits of these boys uh, until the very end. I'll close on one note. In the last week of this story, April 7th to 11th, the Nazis decided to evacuate the camp. The uh, commander, Pfister, was going to turn it over. He promised them that he would turn it over intact to the coming uh, allies. But he was ordered from Berlin to take these boys, take all the prisoners on the road. Um, many of them had been on the road already. So they resisted, and the German communists, to their credit, protected them. Um, they changed their badges so there were no telltale signs that they were Jewish. When the SS came to the barracks, they said, we don't have any Jews here. Um, there was disarray and confusion at the very end until April 10th. And you'll find this in Eli Weisel's night. On April 10th, all the boys were led up to the roll call plaza and were standing there waiting to be led out on the roads onto a death march. And American planes flew overhead, the air raid sirens went off, the SS ran to the shelters, and Kalina, the Czech communist bloc elder who's just declared righteous, um, told the boys, go back to the barrack. The next day the Americans arrived, they were in the barrack, um, and they nearly all live. Um, I'll close on, on that positive note. Um, many of these boys are still alive. They spread all over the world. Um, there's a very tight-knit group of them in Melbourne. Um, they became an extended surrogate family for one another. They're in the United States, Canada, Israel, Paris. Some are in South Africa and uh, in Brazil. Um, and in the last 10 or 15 years, they've been telling their stories, writing their memoirs, giving their testimonies, and the story is now beginning to come to life. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Walzer. Thank all of you for coming. I'd like to invite my family and guests and the friends and the faculty up to the third floor of the library, Judaica Room. I hope that the students at some point 
in the near future. We'll go look at the exhibit, and thank you all.